So that's one way, right? Cepheids, these are the ones, by the way. If, if, if you're talking about finding distance to, to, um, to uh, a star, this is, this is the way to do it. Okay? These are super giant, super bright stars. So in a distant galaxy, we can see um, Cepheid variables. Here's what we do. Well, actually, this is how they work. We think we know how these guys work, right? Let's start with the star contracting and heating up. Well, if it contracts, it heats up because it's a compression. And it heats up for two reasons. Gravitational potential turns into kinetic energy of heat. It also heats up because when you contract a star, there's more pressure in the core and fusion steps up, right? When it heats up, in the atmosphere, there's helium. The helium is singly ionized in the atmosphere, yeah? Right? Well, if you heat it up hot enough, it becomes doubly ionized. If you doubly ionize helium, it becomes plasma, doesn't it? Plasma does not let light through. It becomes opaque. Like, it's like covering a light bulb with tin foil. Now, who in this room has covered a light bulb with tin foil? I have. Why was I covering a light bulb with tin foil? Isn't that a good question? I got one of those like 500 watt light bulbs with the, without the frosting on them. And I covered it with tin foil and then I poked little needle holes in it. What was I making? Was I making my own planetarium? That was a good idea. Except what happens when you cover a light bulb with tin foil? Does it get so hot that it like melts the freaking light bulb? Yeah, I like smell this burning, melting thing. I don't know if the glass melted, but some, something in there just sort of melted and then it like short-circuited and it was pretty exciting, right? <laughs> it was like a little fire in my bedroom. Put yeah, put it in the box over there. Did you do that? Yeah, yeah I love that. Okay, um, so, so here's the deal, right? This star's atmosphere becomes opaque. What's going to happen to the temperature of the star? Yeah, it's just going to go through the roof, right? All that radiation is being trapped in the star. Um, star's envelope, right? It absorbs energy, it expands, it cools. Doubly ionized helium becomes singly ionized, and now the radiation can get out, and it does. So what's it going to do? Go to one, right? Contract. It's going to cool down, contract, heat up, da 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 da, -da there it goes, right? Okay. So, so Cepheid variables have this mechanism that makes them unstable. There's, a, there's a, a, like a, a positive feedback thing, right? As it gets hotter, it causes something that makes it get hotter until it, until it has to expand and cool itself down, right? Okay. Um, now, Cepheid variables are a bit like gongs in percussion. The bigger the gong, the slower they vibrate, yes? Yes? Okay. So a big Cepheid variable takes a longer time to go through this than a small Cepheid variable, yeah? So if you graph... And then and Polaris is only 466 light years away. We have parallax to this, right? Okay. It is, a, it is a Cepheid variable. So we know how far away it is just by geometry, and then we know how bright it really is, right? Okay. Um, so in 1912, Henrietta Leavitt is looking at Cepheid variables in the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. Now, this is sort of, this is sort of interesting because, um, you know, we were starting to get telescopes that can look at, like, Andromeda and see that there's stars there. Right? So, so before they thought they were nebulas, now they're, they're saying, oh, these are galaxies just like ours, and there's stars in there, right? She observes these, these, these Cepheids, and the cool thing here is that all of the, these Cepheids are in these galaxies, they're all roughly the same distance from Earth, because they're in this little knot, yes? Okay, it's not like we're looking way out through space, these things are all a certain distance from Earth, right? Okay? more or less, and so she discovers that there's a period brightness relationship. A star is like a gong here, right? And she discovered, of course, classical Cepheids, and it took a while. We did a lot of bad science until we realized there's actually two types, right? Um, our lie rays are just right here. They're all about this, right? So they have different periods, but there we have it, right? So you can go, and if you measure a star, here's how you measure the distance to a Cepheid is you look at the period, you measure, you know, three periods, because we're IB students, we always take three samples, right? You know, or something like that, right? Okay. Now, if the average period is 10 days, and it's going to, you know, they are, I believe, a bit like a clock, so they're going to be the same, right? Okay. But if you average it all out and you get 10, you go up here and you go, gee, is it a type 2? I don't know how to tell, right? Okay. Hopefully they've got, like, writing on them. 
like type 2 or something like that, right? So you go up here. If it's a classical Cepheid, you can go here. And then you can go here and look at the intrinsic brightness of this. What is true about the intrinsic brightness of that star, of all Cepheids? Are they very bright or are they not so bright? Yeah, I know. Where, what, what is it? Is negative, big negative number, is that bright? That's a real bright star. Yeah, let's, let's remember that, right? So great big negative stars. This, this axis is graphed the correct way. This is bright. This is dim. Okay? Our light rays are not so bright. Yeah? They're like 0 to 1. So they're, you know, they are just ordinary bright stars. These guys are super bright. So Cepheid variables, not only do they, have the, uh, do they have the two wonderful properties. One is that they're bright. So if we can see stars in another galaxy, we can see these stars. They're the bright ones. Right? The second thing that's nice about them is by looking at their, the way they get bright and dark, we can tell how bright they really are. So when I said we could look out there and read the writing on the light bulbs, like 100 watt, 1,000 watt, right, right? We can't do that, but we can do this. This is even better, right? Yeah? You can do this without your bifocals. Yeah, you can tell the period of the star, how long it takes to get bright dark. From that, you can tell how bright it really is. Yeah, Nina. Explain again why it's what? Oh, why it's negative numbers. Um, because um, a long time ago, astronomers were saying, gee, this astronomy stuff is way too easy to understand. Right? So we need to do something to keep people from understanding it. So we're going to make big negative numbers. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer. Why Why they? Yeah, two times ago, right? It's just I don't know why it is. They just made it negative and... I could teach you a positive scale, <laughs> but nobody else would use it. Is the sun zero brightness? Well, the sun's apparent magnitude is minus 26.8, but it's, it's absolute magnitude. If we were 10 parsecs from the sun, it would p appear to be a 4.7. So it's, it's neither super, super bright or... I was wondering whether you're using it the, the baseline. Oh, the baseline for like a zero? Yeah. A zero is just a pretty bright star. I don't know. They just picked an arbitrary thing. Okay. Yeah. You like that? It's all arbitrary. We can't change it. It's way too late to change it. And it's really not all that hard to use. So, you know. Just remember, negative numbers are really bright. You know. uh, da, da, da. Okay, so we've already gone through this, right? Measure its spectrum. Make sure it's a Cepheid variable. Make sure it's like type 2 or classical. I imagine they can tell from the spectrum. That's a guess, right? Measure a couple periods. Look up its absolute magnitude and use that, right? Yeah? Whoa. Yeah? These guys are bright, aren't they? What's brighter than a Cepheid, though? Supernova is brighter than a Cepheid, but here's the problem, right? Supernovas of supergiant stars, supernovas of supergiant stars are very bright. Supernovas of not so big stars aren't as bright. How can you tell which kind it is? But wouldn't all supernovas that are just above the Chandrasekhar limit, they start from just above the Chandrasekhar limit and collapse from there, wouldn't they all be about the same brightness? Yeah. Okay. And so there's a type of supernova, and they're called type 1A. So add a little 1A there on your little note guide. Right? So apparently they've refined this since, you know, 2001 when I made this PowerPoint. I'll have to change that. Okay. Here is the notion is that we've got, and I know I said this was a black hole, but let's pretend it's not yet a black hole, that it's a white dwarf, right? So you've got a white dwarf, a sub Chandrasekhar white dwarf orbiting another white dwarf. Are you picturing this? These guys are going around each other. Okay. A sub Chandrasekhar. You sub Chandrasekhar white dwarf. I think people would probably pull out a weapon. How do you spell it? S-E-K-H-A-R? Is that how you say it? Okay. A sub Chandrasekhar white dwarf is orbiting this guy. Now, as they orbit, as they orbit, the orbit of the sub Chandrasekhar, it's just below the limit. It can't quite collapse. Gravity can't, can't quite supernova this thing. Now, as it orbits, perhaps its orbital trajectory takes it in an ellipse. People running in the hall. Okay. Maybe it takes it on an ellipse so that they sometimes get close, sometimes they're far. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're here, yes? Okay. What happens if it gets so close to this guy that he can eat a little bit of the guy's atmosphere? The white dwarf can gobble a little bit of the guy's atmosphere every time he goes by. Right? So now he's got a mass of 1.35 times the mass of the sun. Now he's got 1.36 times the mass of the sun. 
next time by 1.30.